Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Team Building Fundamentals. And in today's episode, we are going to talk about offense. In particular, uh, what to think about when building offense into your team. My name is Tyler, I go by at to cross online sometimes, and this is my attempt at trying to teach some core fundamentals in team building. So let's go ahead and hop right in. Now, I'm going to talk about what I'm calling modes of offense, and I have three categories that I've kind of put together. Some people might agree with this. Uh, this, I would, I would think this is an exhaustive list, but there could be other ways of thinking about offense. But these are the three ways, and uh, think of it as you can think of it as like this is a team style like of offense or a particular like section of a team that does this style of offense. So. Or that is to say, like you can build a whole team around a mode of offense, or you can sprinkle in different modes of offense into a team, uh, whatever you need. Uh, the important thing is, is that you have offense on your team, no matter which mode you go for, because the goal of the game is to knock out your opponent's Pokemon. The best way to do that is offense. Uh, there's that saying, the best defense is a good offense, and sometimes that really is the case. So. Anyways, so my three modes of offense are hyper offense, setup offense, and balanced offense. And hyper offense tends to use Pokemon that they're fast naturally and they hit hard. Uh, so po a lot of times you'll hear the term glass cannon, like that can fit, like be a perfect description of a hyper offensive Pokemon. It's meant to hit hard and fast and no setup or anything. It's just like it comes out, turn one, immediately putting offensive pressure. On Pokemon so um, they're not all glass cannons so like a Pokemon like Garchomp that I have here is it's I would call it a hyper offensive Pokemon at least in this meta uh, because it's a very good speed tier it's faster than most Pokemon it does a lot of damage especially if you give it like a life orb or something but it actually has pretty good natural bulk uh, but something like Meowscarada doesn't have great bulk but it's the probably the fastest Pokemon in the format of the most common Pokemon used uh, and it can hit pretty hard, especially with the signature move Flower Trick. And then Hydreigon too. You could argue this is also like a balanced offense, but I like Hyper Offense in this format because it's faster than a lot of things and it can do some big damage. So, but the main idea is uh, very little setup to put on immediate offensive pressure. And typically they're faster Pokemon in the format that can do a lot of damage right away. The next mode of offense I have is called Setup Offense. And so, these are Pokemon that they don't necessarily put a ton of pressure offensively right off the get-go. Uh, whether it be because they're really slow or don't have a big attacking stat. Um, but generally they can be bulkier, but they can use a setup move in order to now put on that pressure while also being either um, the fastest Pokemon on the field or now having a big damaging capability. A uh, couple options like Annihilate, you'll see it run bulk upsets in this format. Hattering can set up Trick Room for itself and a partner Pokemon. Rotom can use Nasty Plot to now be like a bulky, tanky Pokemon that also puts on pressure. Uh, so those are some, those are a few options. Um, and often these Pokemon will have support Pokemon next to them to help them set up. Because once they get set up, now they're putting on pressure. Um, and yeah, like pretty pretty straightforward uh, executing these can be tricky at times um, but it can it can be a really fascinating way to just let a game to get out of hand is by enough setting up enough so and then finally what I'm calling balanced offense this one was hard to name because it can be a little hard to describe but I think of these maybe as like tanky Pokemon so maybe it's like tank offense you could call it but these are Pokemon that they have really good offensive capabilities, but they're not necessarily going to like outspeed a lot of Pokemon. They're more going to be able to take a hit and then be able to hit back hard, as hard or harder. Um, so so I say it's like a, that's why I call it balance, because it's a mix of offensive pressure and staying power. Um, and sometimes they can be just faster than a lot of Pokemon too, so they're not necessarily like slow tanky Pokemon all the time, but the main thing is they can take hits better uh, while dealing out a lot of damage. And so 
And these can put on pressure without reliance on speed advantage because of that tankiness. So that's a pretty that's a pretty cool facet. Um, and I think that's what makes balance offense really interesting or balanced, you could say. So anyways, so let's talk about some of the benefits of these offensive plays and styles. Uh, and these modes of offense whether you're talking about like the whole team as this mode or like a part of the team as this mode uh, Anyway, so hyper offense like we said It's a media offensive pressure and it forces your opponent to have to play more reactionary And it can allow you to control the flow of the game because you're putting on the pressure uh, You don't necessarily have to react so much You just have to like try and force your opponent to make a reaction or you can make a good prediction that takes away the game uh, out of their hands so I think that's a big benefit uh, especially as someone who plays more of a balanced offense style or leans towards that I always feel that pressure to like oh I have to react to this lead this off hyper offensive lead right or I could be in trouble um, yeah uh, so, and oftentimes being more like being able to control that flow is really important so another cool thing that I think is actually a benefit is you can win or lose games really fast. And in a tournament, it's actually kind of nice to win or lose really fast because then you get a break in between games where if you're a slow play, like me, you don't get much break between <laughs> matches, which can be really draining. Um, but, and I think that can be just really good, like, as a benefit. So, but I think the biggest thing is being able to force your opponents to have to play reactionary where you can be a little bit more proactive. Um, so take that as you will and so the benefit of setup offense is they can really punish passive or defensive plays and what I mean by that is if you if a Pokemon like going to protect and their, and their other partner Pokemon is going to switch uh, one of the ways to capitalize off that is use a setup move to now put your make yourself like really put on the pressure um, so that's what's really cool about setup uh, offense or like setup moves and like and then again like you can turn really bulky Pokemon not into just bulky Pokemon but into like offensive threats so Rotom and Rosh yeah Rotom Wash is a really good example of that where you'll talk often see him be bulky do some like decent damage with its attacks but do things like Will-O-Wisp uh, to burn Pokemon uh, but if you then you get a chance to use a move like Nasty Plot okay now you have a bulky Pokemon that can do a lot of damage which is really cool um, and oftentimes that can allow for like an easy checkmate or like say you get a couple boosts of Calm Mind up and your opponent only has special attackers and now suddenly they can't suddenly they can't do enough damage and you're doing so much damage back like especially since Pokemon's a game of numbers you can set yourself up with setup moves into a position where it's like almost mathematically impossible that they beat you um, so that can be really cool about setup um, it can really get out of hand if you are in the right situation. And then one of the benefits of balanced offense is you have a little bit more room for error or bad luck. And I say that because typically since a balanced offense approach will be a little bulkier, it means you can like take a hit and be okay or make a switch and be okay. Whereas like with hyper offense, if you if you have a r error or bad luck, like your Pokemon may not be able to take a single hit, so uh, so that's really nice. And you can play in and out of Trick Room, and I find that is a big benefit because Trick Room is just a very prevalent move in VGC. So being able to play in and out of it, whether Trick Room is up or not, is really nice. Even though, like, if you're right in the middle, you may you'll probably always be going last, uh, but it's not a bad thing because of that bulk you're relying on. So, whereas like really fast for our Pokemon really can't let Trick Room go up. Um, and then of course, like because of that bulk, you can tank a hit if you need to. Uh, sometimes you might just be faster, which is a benefit, but a lot of times like, you gotta tank hits. Uh, but you have the bulk to do it to then return the offensive uh, damage back. Alright, so now what are some challenges to these? And I've kind of already touched on them a little bit, especially in contrasting Hyper Offense and Balanced Offense. Uh, so with hyper offense, one bad turn can set you way back. Like uh, they make a play that you attack into that doesn't work out very well, uh, and then you lose one of your Pokemon, and you can kind of just go downhill from there. Uh, a fully hyper offensive team doesn't really have much switch potential, so once you like send Pokemon out, you're kind of locked in. 
you have to make really good um, sw timely switches to do it. You can't usually just switch a Pokemon in because you're usually if you're a full hyper offensive team, you're not a very bulky team. Uh, so that's for a team aspect, that's a struggle. Um, but also, like one bad turn can just lose you a Pokemon, and that could be costly uh, if that Pokemon's really important. Uh, struggles against Trick Room, a lot of times, hyper, especially again talking about more of a whole team of Hyper Offense, it really has to have a way to stop Trick Room, because once Trick Room goes up, it could just be game over. Um, same with the Hyper Offensive mode, you have to really think about Trick Room. So like if you're leading Hyper Offense into a Trick Room setup, um, you gotta switch some stuff out into like your other Pokemon that aren't just gonna get bodied in Trick Room, because they rely so heavily on the speed advantage. Um, and often, I would call this a challenge because there's times where you have to make really good predictions to capitalize off your offense uh, because your, po your opponent can, if you're playing against bulkier Pokemon, they're probably going to try and pull switches and sometimes that requires like really ballsy predictions and if you make a wrong prediction, it can go really bad at that point and allow your po your opponent to then like shift the board or shift their positioning and just where now they're putting on the pressure and there's not much you can do about it so um, if you like the prediction game it's probably a better type of offense for you but if you really struggle with the prediction game or really are uncomfortable with having to make a lot of predictions then hyper offense will be really challenging uh, and so now getting to set up offense so it requires a turn or multiple turns to set up and that can be really hard just because it allows your opponent to either do some damage or do their own setup. Uh, you can't just like send it in and immediately do damage, you have to take a turn to do that. And another one I find is when you want to run a setup move it often comes at the cost of a better type coverage so you can't run a move to cover something that you would you otherwise can't hit with your like stab moves so that that can be a downside there so like I think of Tyran yeah like Tyranitar is a pretty decent example or even Garchomp if you want to run Swords Dance Garchomp you have to give up either Rock Slide or Dragon Claw and that can be problematic because Rock Slide is really good for like hitting things immune to ground like flying types or levitators but Dragon Claw is just a really good strong stab move which has more power than rock slide but it's nice to have that rock coverage against certain things that dragon claw may not hit very well so you have to give something up or you have to give up protect which some people do but i'm not comfortable with doing that sometimes um and tyranitar is another example because you want rock move dark move and often it'd be nice to have like a coverage move like a fighting type move or something but to run something like dragon dance you have to give up protect or a coverage move and so that's a big downside uh, and I consider this a challenge where like timing is everything and the reason I say this is a challenge is because you can use a setup move at a time when you need to be attacking uh, it's really tempting to just go for setup because you want to just get that set up and, and then do the damage but if you set up on a turn where you you should be attacking it can really set you back so um, in the case of having a Pokemon to help support the setup, that's not necessarily the case. But I would say there is a challenge of like requiring a setup Pokemon, which means you have less offensive pressure if you have a setup and an offensive Pokemon. Uh, you need that setup to then really put on the pressure. So moving on to the challenges of balanced offense. Uh, these This kind of style can be really susceptible to critical hits and secondary effects. And secondary effects I'm thinking of are like, Rock Slide flinches or Ice Beam freezes or something like that. Um, and because typically these Pokemon are a little slower, uh, so they can be bulkier, which means things like flinching be can become a big problem, whereas fast Pokemon don't have to worry about that because they're moving before they can get flinched anyways. And then there are definitely situations where this mode requires speed control. Like if you have a lot of balanced offense on your team, you're going to want speed control. Like even though... One of the pros of balanced offense is that it doesn't require, it doesn't really need speed advantage to do well. 
Um, you can actually flip that. It's like a blessing and a curse. There are some situations where you've got to have speed control options. Uh, we're like a hyper offensive team. You don't necessarily need to run speed control because your speed control is that you're just faster. But some of the more tanky Pokemon, uh, there are times because of just way type advantages work, you've got to have speed control options so you're ready to utilize those in order to let your Pokemon um, do their job of dealing offensive damage. Okay, so we'll get some to ex a couple examples here to kind of give an idea of some of these considerations. But when you're building a team, you, you, here's some things I think that are really important to think about. So one of the obvious ones is type coverage. And you want to think of this in terms of like one Pokemon, like what kind of type is it able to cover and doing good damage to you with its own typing of attacks. And you also want to think of a whole team. Um... Look at your whole team is like what what type coverage like do I do really well or like what type of Pokemon do I need better coverage for uh, you just you really want to think about that and think about like with one Pokemon and how much coverage does it really need or do you does it have other Pokemon on the team that make up for that lack of coverage and that's where you think about the whole team in terms of coverage um yeah so, and I'll get into an example of how this can matter, like such as um, if you're a steel type, you want to have a Pokemon with coverage that deals with fire types. Well, because the steel type is weak to fire, uh, unless that Pokemon can have a coverage move, but even then it may not be strong enough. So, yeah, so just really think about how the Pokemon are covering each other and build according to commonly used Pokemon in the meta. Uh, this usually... This usually gives more consistency or more consistent success for a team because obviously if you're beating common stuff or at least have plans to beat common stuff, you're going to win at least like two thirds of your games um, by just playing well and executing those game plans against those common Pokemon. Uh, the Pokemon are used commonly for a reason. Uh, it is what it is. You just got to build for it. So always be thinking about the Pokemon that are common and your how you might specifically deal with some of those Pokemon. Especially if there's like one that gives you a little bit more trouble than another. Like just have very good plans. Um, and again, having good coverage to cover that Pokemon is one of those ways to do that. Another one, knowing your speed tiers. Speed tiers, speed tiers are so important. Um, especially if you're doing single battles, but since we're talking double battles, they're still important. Um, and then uh, double battles, one of the important things is knowing how modifiers affect and kind of knowing specific speed stats for example if you're running a Pokemon with Choice Scarf uh, to outspeed Garchomp with a Choice Scarf you need at least a speed stat of 114 so knowing that stuff is really helpful and then of course knowing like which fast Pokemon are relevant to know and then know those modifiers and all that so it's really important to become familiar with that with any given format and then finally I can't emphasize this enough I've struggled with this when I was new think about Pokemon in pairs we're playing double battles with VGC so even if one Pokemon such as let's say a Dragon is really good against another Pokemon like Armor Rouge you've got to think about what's next to Armor Rouge because we play double battles, and it's never it's it's really easy to think um, in va like a one-on-one -on -one vacuum, like single battles. But fortunately, this is not. So if you're trying to beat Hydreigon or Golden Go, you need to think about how that works when that Murkrow is sitting next to those Pokemon. Like, how does that change the matchup? Because that can make a huge difference. Uh, really quick, one example I remember. Uh, reading about in 2014 Kangaskhan was a really good Pokemon but it kind of like got phased out by Mega Mawile um, but in 2015 Kangaskhan just became like the unquestioned king because it got paired with Landorus Therian form and that combination was really good so uh, that's why it's really important to be thinking in pairs and um, this example, first example will kind of depict that a little bit more. So, I've been running Pomo, like an offensive Pomo, a lot. And part of it is because 
it can uh, attack Hydreigon and Oko it. So if they like Terra into something, like a My Life Orb Terra Double Shock will knock it out, or I could just Close Combat it to take it out. However, there is a problem. Pommelt's really frail and it needs to move first. Murkrow is typically paired with Hydreigon and it runs Tailwind. It uses Tailwind, Hydreigon's now faster, Hydreigon can now knock out my Pommelt because Pommelt's are really frail Pokemon. So that's a problem. So I gotta think of that combination. So how do I deal with that? Well, I also have a pair of Pokemon and I use Ndidi a lot with Pommelt because it has the move Follow Me. Hydreigon typically attacks with uh, single target moves. So I use Follow Me, redirect the attack into Ndidi, protecting Palmo, even though Tailwind went up and Hydreigon's moving faster. And now I knock it out. So, um, and that's kind of an uh, uh, example on paper of how to think in pairs. So again, like Hydreigon, like I'm using Palmo because I think it can really beat some of the meta stuff like Hydreigon, but I have to think about the Tailwind that's sitting next to it. How do I deal with that? Um, something like redirection helps and yada yada yada. I hope that helps get an idea in a really sort of like simple way that um, you can then have as a fundamental idea and then just build off that into more complex uh, pairings and situations. All right, one more example for you guys and uh, then we'll be done. Uh, this is kind of thinking about like typing in relationships while thinking of these pairs. So, for example, we have Hydreigon, which likes to typically, one of its common terror types is Steel, so it can actually have a better matchup against fairy types such as Sylveon. So, like Hydreigon goes Terra Steel, so it can use the Flash Cannon attack that is now Stab to deal with, help deal with Sylveon and resist its fairy type moves. Uh, but here's a problem. In this uh, sort of theoretical example, there's a Volcarona next to the Sylveon, and Volcarona is, has a higher base speed stat than Hydreigon, so if this Volcarona is max speed, it's actually faster, and now it can just use a fire type into my Terra Steeled Hydreigon to knock it out. And then if I don't Terra, uh, that Sylveon is going to knock me out with its fairy moves. So that's an issue, and this is where thinking about coverage and like what's next to what. So in this scenario, Hydreigon will struggle with either of these, whether it Terra or not. So I need something that can cover one of those. And lo and behold, there's actually a really good partner for Hydreigon, and that's Garchomp. Garchomp can fire off a Rock Slide into this Volcarona, which would probably knock it out if it's not Sash or something. Um, and another cool synergy is that Earthquake with Garchomp doesn't hit Hydreigon because it has the ability to levitate. But anyways, the idea here, Garchomp can deal with the Volcarona so that Hydreigon can Terra Steel and deal with Sylveon. Um, so this is kind of like a theoretical example on paper. Typically there's a lot more going on but you can just see how the stage is set to where Garchomp is covering Hydreigon but Hydreigon is covering Garchomp because Garchomp's threatened by the Sylveon. Um, so again, think in pairs and how things work together and cover each other's weaknesses and that's what I try and been um, even myself learning like I have this offensive Pokemon I really like what are its weaknesses what can I put next to it to cover those weaknesses so it can do its job of offense as best as possible um, so that's that uh, and that is about all I have for you guys in this episode I hope you find that helpful um, and if you have any other like sort of guide ideas you'd like to hear feel free to throw those my way because I am always looking for ideas to try and um, just impart some of my experience of playing VGC for six years onto you guys to help you learn and grow as players and take fundamental ideas that you can apply to any situation going forward so anyways um, ignore that <laughs> Thing about I don't have sample teams in the description I just copied this from a previous video um, but be sure to like and subscribe I really appreciate it and it helps me see what uh, you guys are watching and enjoying so plus if you subscribe you can find out when I upload new guide videos so anyways guys have a great rest of your day and we'll catch you in the next episode see ya